I'll be chair. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. I think we are back live now. Yeah, um, just, great. Just give it one second. Make yep. sure. YouTube, yeah, but it will. Awesome. We're good. Great. Good. Okay, great. Well, welcome back again. <laughs> We're. Um, this is the House Transportation Committee, uh, Wednesday morning, February 15th. <laughs> And uh, we have some di technical difficulties with our live stream. So I'll just say we're this morning we're joined by. Uh, okay. yeah, I, class, class. I think we are back. Yeah, right? We are back. <laughs> I'm hearing myself. That's how I sound, huh? Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, we have Matt Cota here with the, um, the Director of Government Affairs, Vermont Association of Vehicle and Auto Dealers. And Matt, I don't think we need to rewind completely, but I just want to say welcome. And if you could just identify yourself for the record, and we will continue. Um, thank you so much for your patience. And, and thank you. Um, Matt Coda uh, with a company called Metal Hill, which is a nonprofit trade association management and government affairs firm here on behalf of one of my clients, the Vermont Vehicle and Automotive Distributors Association, where I serve as their government affairs director, uh, prov providing an overview of um, the cars that, and trucks and, and vehicles that we sell in Vermont through um, a service that we provide for our members called the Vermont Vehicle Index. The Vermont Vehicle Index, as we've discussed, and as uh, thank you for those that were able to attend our, our breakfast meeting. Um, <clears throat> provides a way that we can look at where we are as a state, um, as an industry, in terms of what we sell, and look to the future in terms of what we're going to sell and what what we need to do in order to meet the mandates and the goals um, of this energy transformation that we're all experiencing. So back to page number, and I should have numbered these, um, but back to the page with the big pie chart and the big orange Thing. We're still largely a gasoline driven powertrain, right? So most of the cars, the vehicles in Vermont, 84% of them sold in 2022, new and used, um, run on gasoline. And we know that we've got a steep road. I know I keep using the car analogies. We have a steep road ahead if we are to meet both the uh, mandates in the zero emission vehicle regulation, which we we'll talk about, and uh, in our own climate goals which include a significant uptake in the sales of battery electric, hybrid electric, and plug-in hybrid vehicles. In fact, the Vermont Climate Action Plan uh, calls for 27,000 EVs in 2025, that's in just less than two years, and 126,000 by the end of the decade. Um, we are selling less vehicles in 2022 than we did in 2021. Um, that's not because people are all taking the bus, although, you know, certainly we, um, we understand that public transportation is an important part of our, of our transportation initiative. It's largely due because there are fewer vehicles. If you drove on Shelburne Road in South Burlington and Shelburne, if you drove on Route 7 in Rutland, if you drove through Middlebury, you'll have noticed something that you don't usually see, pavement. Because a lot of the car lots were empty this summer. If you tried to buy a car this summer, you'll notice it was very challenging. Those are the supply chain problems that we all experienced in every sector of our economy, but certainly when it comes to vehicles. Um, those have are getting better. They're not nearly as bad as they were um, in 2022. And we have high hopes that in 2023, whatever industry you're in, that those supply chain issues, because we know that supply constraints um, lead to less volume, but they also lead to higher prices for consumers. That's, that's how it works. You have a fixed cost. You pay your mortgage, you pay your employees, you pay your taxes, you pay your loans for your inventory, and lower volumes means higher prices. And you can see that in the, in the, in the information that you receive from Tom Cavett. Purchase and use, which is how we tax vehicle sales, um, those receipts are up even though sales were down. So Vermont's low and zero, zero vehicle regulation, we're all, um, I'm sure, aware of this. Uh, on December 16th, I believe, it was um, codified into regulation by the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. It adopts the California Air Resources Board um, regulation, which requires the auto manufacturers to deliver in a ZEV state, which now Vermont is one of, I believe there's nearly 20 now, um, to deliver in ever-increasing numbers zero emission vehicles to Vermont. It doesn't require Vermonters to purchase them. It doesn't require dealers, the beta members to sell them, but it requires the auto manufacturers to deliver them to Vermont 
starting at 35% in 2026, just two and a half years, all the way up to 100% in 2035. So this will have a dramatic impact, of course, on how cross-border sales. If you live along the Connecticut River, which some of you do, um, you might be in a, we might be in a situation 10 years time in which because if New Hampshire still refuses to adopt, which they have not yet, the zero emission vehicle regulation, we could be in a situation where New Hampshire people who want to come to Vermont, or excuse me, that want to buy a zero emission vehicle find that they might have greater success if they cross over to the Connecticut, the western side of the Connecticut and purchase it in Brattleboro because there might be more choice in Keene because the auto manufacturers will be required to deliver more vehicles to Brattleboro than they will be to Keene or Lebanon versus White River. But you also might find the opposite could be true in which if consumers do not wish to purchase battery electric vehicles, they'll find greater choice in color and, 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 and models on the eastern side of the Connecticut River. We don't know any of this. I don't have a crystal ball, and the one I have is pretty fuzzy. But these are some of the things we think about as we think about how this regulation will impact sales in Vermont. Of course, if you're a Vermonter and you register and you go for a green plate in, 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 at the DMV, you're going to pay the purchase use tax regardless of where you purchased it. That's a good thing. But for the local dealers who employ local people and pay local property taxes, we certainly want you to purchase in Vermont. So we want to make sure we have the cars and the trucks that consumers want to buy. Um, and if consumers move to battery electric vehicles, then this regulation will do a great thing for those members. If they choose not to, then that they may go to New Hampshire. And we won't be able to, we'll have zero, we'll have zero emission vehicles on our lot that we perhaps don't sell as well as the combustion engine vehicles on the other side, but that's still, 10 years out, it's not now. So what is Vermont doing? Well, quite a lot. And these are slides that were borrowed from other presentations that you've seen before here. You know, whether we're working with Efficiency Vermont and Drive Electric Vermont, it was a fantastic website where you can see all of the different step utility, state and federal um, incentives in order to buy an electric vehicle or a zero emission vehicle. We've been working, the VEDA members have been working with Green Mountain Power, our largest electric utility, also with BIPSA. Um, there's a great resource, I'm happy to share the link, uh, it's more directed towards auto sellers from the National Auto Dealers Association, showing which cars and how to deliver these incentives through the Inflation Reduction Act, which are generous, but confusing. There are all these sorts of stipulations that are tied to the IRA in terms of where the, where the parts are procured, where the battery comes from, all good things to promote North American supply so we're not just simply buying stuff from overseas that we have no control over how they procure the batteries. All good things focused on lower income Vermonters, excuse me, lower income people in the United States so that they can access these vehicles. Um, all good things, but a layer of complication, which we are still as an industry sorting out. Um, so we have the incentives. We have the federal state utility incentives. Um, we have great partnerships in order to make this transformation. But on the next page, um, you'll see what we have to do as an industry, those that are selling new and used vehicles in Vermont in order for us to deliver these new, new vehicles, these zero emission vehicles. One is you're, you're always a supply. We don't produce cars in Vermont. So it's the supply chain issue. Those don't change. Um, those have been a problem in 2022. Will they be a problem in 2026 and onward as we, as we as we seek to sell more electric vehicles, we don't know. But the biggest issue for an electric vehicle seller, for a new car dealer or used car dealer that wants to sell a vehicle is the charging equipment. And some of this is simple, is simple cost, capital cost. Others is an accident of geography. So in order for us to obtain the vehicles from the original equipment manufacturers, your Fords, your Chevys, Subarus, there are franchise requirements. If you drive by a Volkswagen, you'll notice, huh, they all have the same sort of motif, right? Just like a Subway sandwich shop. We have to have, we have franchise agreements with the original equipment manufacturers that require our, our buildings to look a certain way, require our sales force to, to, to work a certain way. And the reality is, is that if we are going to sell and get the allotment of zero emission vehicles to these dealerships, 
they have to be prepared to meet those franchise agreements, which are different depending on your original equipment manufacturer, but all require an investment in charging stations. And that makes sense too, right? I mean, if you go to any car dealer, they either have access to or are close to what a car wash as cars come in and they want you to drive them out clean um, into gas, gas tanks. Well, just like they have to have gas tanks to make sure you leave with a full tank, they have to have charging equipment. That's what the manufacturers will require. They're not going to ship a bunch of electric cars to a car dealer that doesn't have any charging equipment because you can't drive it off the lot. You can't service it. And you want the customer to leave happy with a full tank of gas or a fully charged battery. And that's an expense, right? And we know these expense. These, these capital costs from charging equipment comes from AOT. And we know that it's not a level one. We're not going there. That's a Betamax machine. It's not happening. Level two, yes. But DC, 150 kilowatt, level three chargers is where we need to go. Level two is great for the home, for the business. But if you are going to put charging stations at convenience stores and you're going to put them at car dealerships, um, they need to be level three. And that is a significant cost. And you got to have more than one. How many you have to have? Well, that's an interesting debate. But when the auto, when the original equipment manufacturer says you got to have four in the front and four in the back, you don't have to, you can't say, ah, I think I'll just do two. If you just say, I'll just do two, then you don't get your allotment of Ford Lightnings. You don't get your allotment of Leafs. And that's a problem for what we're trying to do for our goal, for our energy goals, for our climate goals, and for meeting the zero emission vehicle regulation. Part of the reason too, that it's an accident of geography is where is that dealership located? So if you are on route seven, you likely have access to three phase power, which you need for DC chargers. If you're in Stockbridge, it's a little bit more challenging. The investment becomes higher if you have to not only just buy the equipment from ChargePoint or whoever the manufacturer is, but, but you also have to pay for the line. So we're working with Green Mountain Power and they've been very receptive to this problem, which is how do we locate the new car dealers? How do we make sure that they have access to three-phase power? Again, many of, many of these dealers didn't know this was a problem two years ago. Is it, but they're learning. Are they new dealers, um, Matt? Or are they, are they are, are, I, I guess my assumption was is that existing dealers were often taking in, taking on electric vehicles. Is that, am I, that's, is that's that a, a correct assumption? That's exactly right. But, but the sales of, of new battery electric vehicles, we sold 1,718, right? We sold 100,000 vehicles in 2022. We sold 1,718 battery electric vehicles. But we're talking about selling 26,000, just a couple of years. We're talking about selling 100,000 by the end of the decade in order to take on that amount of vehicles and then sell them to consumers, significant more than existing investments in level two chargers have to happen. There's no question. We want more vehicles. Our OEMs will require us to purchase them, but even if they didn't require them, how are you gonna sell an electric vehicle if you don't have, an, have your charging infrastructure on site so someone can drive it off the lot? You need it. So um, we have until 9.15, so um, Quick question. Do you have any, yeah, Representative Campbell. Thank you. Do you have any sense of how many dealers don't have access to three phase, don't have three phase That's my question. on the street in front of them right now? Any sense of that? That is a great question, Representative Campbell. And when I was brought in to manage this association, that was the first question I asked. And in Green Mountain Power has a great map showing us uh, showing where the uh, phase three power lines are, but then then how do you get it to the store? Hmm. And then that's the next thing that I, that's a known unknown. From the street, you mean to the, to the street? to the store. Uh -huh. what, what, is the, what, what is the ability to access federal and state funds for a private for-profit business in order to install these devices? We don't, these are all these questions that we, these are known unknowns. We need to answer them. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we had a couple questions. Did Representative Shaw or Representative, Representative Burke, did you have one? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I want him to get to the uh, so So finally, and I'm happy to answer any questions and provide more granularity on the Vermont Vehicle Index. This is just the highlights. Um, if you want to know what particular model, how many they, we sold in 2022, I have access to all that data. But the last page is to just to highlight a, and thank you for those that attended our meeting um, last week. 
um, because I did talk about this briefly, um, which is we still sell gasoline powered cars and they still have something called catalytic converters, which reduce the amount of um, pollutants in the atmosphere. They're sure good things, but they're also contain precious metals, lots of like rhodium and lots of things I can barely pronounce. All I know is that a cordless Sawzall in the middle of the night takes one of them off or two or three or four can sell them at scrap metal for increased, it's, it's an epidemic, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an epidemic. It's a, it's a fast growing crime. It's, and then even if you caught, even if you went to the store or to the uh, um, scrap metal yard and you found it, say, yep, that's definitely mine. You can't reattach it, not to a new car. And oftentimes you can't attach it to a, to a used car. If you did it yourself, you couldn't do it. So this is not a Vermont problem. You know, this, these, these, these vandalism, these thieves are up. It, and here's the problem from an auto dealer's perspective, not covered by insurance. And, and because of the supply chain issues, which you all know, that car will sit on that pavement and it cannot be sold until, a new, and you don't have a shop full of catalytic converters just ready to install as soon as the, it gets stolen. Sometimes a week, sometimes two weeks. The point is, is that, that that is not generating income. That is taking up pavement. And a, someone can come in and take $60,000 worth of catalytic converters in an hour and a half. And we think that S48 will not solve this problem. We're not that eyes wide open. Um, but it will make it a little bit harder for someone to steal a catalytic converter from a gasoline a powertrain vehicle and sell it at a scrapyard for a profit, make it a little bit harder. Right now, it's suggested that the scrapyard ask, is this yours? It's not required. Um, if someone shows up with a pickup truck with six, full, six brand new catalytic converters, you can sell them. We suggest that if you have a catalytic converter from a car that doesn't work and you want to sell it to the scrapyard, that's fine. But showing up with more than one in, in you know, one morning, you know, with sawdust, or not sawdust, with metal dust all over you and a, and a, and a, and a cordless sawzall in the back, I think we should ask um, those that um, sell precious metals or accept precious metals to have a little more scrutiny. But the reality is, is no one's quite figured out how to fix this. There is a national bill which would require the auto manufacturers to stamp every catalytic converter so we can track down uh, organized crime if they are participating in it. We're not suggesting that because having a Vermont flavor for that might be challenging, but we are supportive of the national bill to do that. I think we have a couple of questions um, to Representative McCoy. So I think I saw this on TV last week where they actually have this piece of metal that they attach where the catalytic converter mm -hmm. is underneath. So while it won't completely prevent it, it's, it's kind of like a, if they go underneath, it's going to take them longer to get the catalytic converter because they have to unbolt this thing from it. I think it was on like CBS Sunday morning or something. Interesting. I'll look into that. Okay. It was like this metal thing that they put up and bolted on. You could buy it or something. I don't know. Just check that out. I will. Report that, how much that costs. <laughs> we have Representative Burke and Representative Dodge. Just some questions. Representative Burke? Um, is there a role for the legislature in this issue of getting the, um, the line to the dealerships? <sighs> So there is, there will be legislation at some point to um, allow the pilot program three years ago that Efficiency Vermont undertook to spend $2 million, $6 million total, $2 million per year for the next three years of rate pair money, um, electric rate pair money on efforts to help start drive electric, um, which they've done successfully. It's a great program. And to, um, to educate consumers on the merits of better electric vehicles. Uh, we're supportive of that, absolutely. And uh, we are part of the conversation with Efficiency Vermont and how we can utilize perhaps less on TV ads because OEMs are got a lot of TV ads about electric vehicles. We don't think that's the issue, is that people don't know about electric vehicles. We think the issue is, is that there needs to be some expertise in how to coordinate, how to make those connections. And Efficiency Vermont can play a role with that and that money perhaps can play a role in that. Um, and so those conversations are ongoing. I don't know what type of, if it's reauthorized, I don't know what type of um, guardrails they'll be put on how they spend that money. 
my conversations with Efficiency Vermont, with the leaders there have been less money on TV ads, more money on making sure that we have the equipment so we can take delivery of the vehicle. Because if we don't make those, if the dealers don't make the investments in the infrastructure, the vehicles aren't coming. They might be coming to New York, they might be coming to New Jersey, they might be going to Boston where the, the large capitalized dealers have, but the, the 90 plus new car dealers in Vermont are largely still local family owned companies. It's not unlike another client I have um, that sells eating oil. These are second, third generation companies. They live where they work, their employees are here and facing increasing pressure to consolidate because that's the way of the world, right? But I think there's something worth protecting as the local auto dealer um, because by and large, they are local companies. Um, and I think that has value. Okay, I think Representative Dodge. Yeah, I was just curious whether you could speak to like how are the dealers in Vermont doing currently, you know, uh, compared to past years, and um, you know, it's it's like you presented this this future that is you know hinging on how buyers feel about going electric. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could speak to how the dealers are feeling about that, and and then just you know, financially, how they are actually doing in the past, you know, through the pandemic and now. So there are dealers that have made significant investments on in, in moving to battery electric because they see what's happening and they want, and they long before the ZEV regulation passed, we saw it happening. You see it in the marketplace. You can see the investments, the billions of dollars investment the OEMs are making. Um, all you know in the United States and across the world in battery electric technology, and there are some that have made significant investments in Ken because they have that capacity. There are others that will not be able to, and you can guess who those are. Those are some of the smaller dealers, and their choice is to find the financing in order to make that investment and stay a franchise dealer, or to become a used car dealer, some have done that, or to become, um, to sell their franchise and just get out. Um, to a, and it's, if they're gonna sell, they're not gonna sell to another small dealer, they're gonna sell to a larger dealer. But here's the other point, two thirds of our vehicle sales are used. And eventually all these new battery electric vehicles that we're selling over the next 10 years will become used. And one presumes it will behave just like the combustion engine market and, and they'll wanna sell them. All those used car dealers, not now, I mean, it'd be great if it was now, but definitely after the new cars, this new line, after this, this turnover of, four, of uh, four years, four or five years in which someone wants to upgrade their, their, their Leaf or their, their Lightning to the next version, they will also need to be able to have charging technology. And you see a lot of used car dealers off the beaten path, right? They're not on Shelburne Road. They're not on Route 7. They're a little bit off on Route 2, or they're a little bit there, a little bit there, because that's where land is less expensive. And that's also where a three-phase power is a little bit more expensive to get to them. So the first the first phase, no pun intended, I've used that word too many times, is, is to make sure that the 90 new car dealers, <coughs> they understand this transition, that they're able to access the capital and, and, their, and the power to build the, the charging infrastructure and to take delivery of these of these electric vehicles. The next is to making sure when the consumers decide to resell those vehicles, um, that there is a marketplace or a infrastructure for used car sellers to be able to sell them. And and that's just, that's money. That's money and investment. Sometimes it's an accident geography. If you happen to be in some place, which it's good, just like, just like internet, right? Another one of my clients. If you are in an area, if you are my parents on Hartley Hill, Vermont, you waited a really long time for DSL. You were going to wait an even longer time for fiber. Well, that's what you, that's what it takes if you live in the country. Um, some dealers that live in the country, it's going to be much harder for them. Just plainly spoken, not they're against used vehicle, uh, electric vehicles, not at all. They want to sell what the consumers want to buy. It's just that it's going to be a little bit more challenging. So a couple of questions, but I think we have time for one. And I, I Representative Bartholomew was, we have, we have to wrap up for our next said testimony. That the franchise model served the consumer the best. Mm -hmm. Why is, what's the issue with a dealer, I mean, a manufacturer direct to sale um, model? So where do they fall short? So, so as you know, direct to consumer is allowed in Vermont 
a Tesla uh, company can set up a, as they are expected to do in my hometown of South Burlington, set up a service center. Um, and I think that is a recognition that with the faults, quite frankly, of the direct consumer market, the reason why they want a service center, Tesla wants a service center in South Burlington is because people that own Teslas don't want to put their their new car on a car carrier and send it to New Jersey or to New York to get serviced. So there's value in having Ford certified technicians and Nissan certified technicians that can service the vehicles, particularly with all the new vehicles, if there is something wrong with it, if there is a recall to that to that piece of equipment. And they have to replace an entire, as Rivian is experiencing right now, trying to figure out how to do a small change to, um, to their truck, to the electric truck. Without service centers, without the franchise system, consumers are left to having people come to them at a very large expense to the OEMs, I would say, um, and, and fix it on the street, or to put it on a diesel tractor trailer truck car carrier and send it to wherever there is a service center. So you'd have the same problem if you had a very obscure, if you, I don't know, what would be a, a Fiat Ferrari. Ferrari. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're, if you're driving a McLaren, <laughs> it's going to be very difficult for you to find someone who works on McLarens in, in Rutland. So it's not necessarily, it's has to do with the availability of the service centers as opposed to the model of how it's sold. This seems like what I'm hearing you say. In, in Tesla, when it said, if it, decides to, if it goes through the planning process and it gets the permit and takes an old Hannaford and turns it into a service center, they'll have to, because of the law passed here, which is a good law, they'll have to apply for a dealer, they'll have to post a surety bond, they'll have to do all the things that every other franchise does. And I think the reason why they're doing it is because they realize that there's a big advantage of the franchise model. They're not going to go the exact same way, but that's okay. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Matt, for coming in. This thank you. Morning. And I want to say, you know, we know that to we our our dealers are part of the solution. You know, we need to have we know that um, uh, to get to this high ambitious number of adoption of electric vehicles. So we really appreciate hearing from you. Thank and, you very much. Uh, and um, and if members have questions, can we maybe I don't see your email contact. Is it on this in this? Maybe that might be. I will send that around. Yeah, that'd be great. If you want to send it to to, to me, or, um, I'm happy to share that around, or you can send it to the committee. Yep. Be, that would be great. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for coming in and um, look forward to you know, continuing to hear your feedback on how we're doing. So um, today, we're going to shift. Where today is. Arts Advocacy Day in the legislature. So I thought that it would be important and fun to have some folks from the Vermont Arts Council and the Agency of Transportation to come in and talk about some of the, some of the programs that they have going on. So, um, so I think we have Amy Cunningham and Michelle Bailey. And is is um, is Jacqueline coming in too? Is, Jackie said she was coming. Yeah. yeah, so you know what? Why don't, why don't we have a second folding chair up there? Um, we can, I think we can have two people. Oh, thank you. I can uh, do a little tag team if that's all right. Great. We're so happy to be here. Great. Well, welcome to the show. And of course, we've got show and tell because we're arts folks. So I think it's taken so. We have um, the if, if you want to put something up on the screen, we have an HDMI. Jenny, had, Jeannie had told me to bring. Great. Okay. So you know, you know, you know. You can plug in right into your laptop. Uh, laptop has like no ports in it, so I have to bring the spot the adapter. He's up for it. You know, those yeah, are laptops these days. Let's see here. I know my CD. I officially have nothing to play a CD anymore. Here we go. Oh yeah. So committee, here we go. Like, welcome. Yes, have a seat, Amy. And if you, you and Michelle, if you can just identify yourselves for the record, we're happy to hear uh, uh, from you today um, about some of the arts and transportation programs that you have um, have going on. So perfect. Well, Thank you, Chair Coffey. My name is Amy Cunningham. I'm the Interim Executive Director at the Vermont Arts Council, and I'm here today with my colleague. Yes, I'm Michelle Bailey. I'm the Senior Program Manager at the Vermont Arts Council. 
So uh, happy, as, as Chair Coffey said, it's uh, Creative Sector Day in the State House. And so uh, this is one of several committees uh, where folks from the arts and cultural sector are here to talk about the many ways that arts and culture are not a separate thing, not a set aside. They're part of the solution for so many of uh, you know the aspects of Vermont's future. I was talking to some friends who were surprised that I was coming to the Transportation Committee. And I thought, I guess I've, I've worked with Michelle long enough and worked with the Arts Council long enough that I was like, why would you be surprised that we're talking about arts and transportation? It's, it's inherent. So anyway, I, I hope um, this will uh, kind of help to affirm that a bit. Uh, we're here on uh, the occasion of Creative Sector Day, but also to celebrate a recent national report um, issued by the, the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. Uh, they did kind of a policy strategy sampler of the states where uh, the Arts Council and the AOT are working closely together on, on public art transportation enhancements. Uh, and this, and Vermont is one of the uh, spotlighted um, states. So they highlight uh, partnership and partnerships in several other states. And you might recognize they chose a photo for the cover of their report uh, from Waterbury, just off the Rotary. This is an animating infrastructure project um, created by artist Phil Godenschwager. So our history with working with art and transportation goes back a long time. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, ways that, that public arts uh, integrated into uh, transportation, in particular Danville project that my colleague Michelle was involved in for many years. So I'm just, I'm gonna brag on Michelle for a couple slides here because she's too modest to do it herself. Uh, so this Danville project, this is really where the relationship between the Vermont Agency of Transportation and the Vermont Arts Council began. In 1999, uh, we partnered on the oversight and management of the Danville Transportation Enhancement Project, a program designed to nurture collaboration between artists, community members, and engineers in the redevelopment of a section of US Route 2 that runs through the center of Danville. Artwork was integrated throughout the village. This project was completed in 2014. There were traffic calming elements and artistic enhancements to the surrounding area that include sculptural granite posts, a redesigned bandstand, as well as stone walls and plantings. Senator Leahy's office was instrumental in supporting the project and helping to secure the enhancement funding at the time. So this, this represents an early creative placemaking project uh, and included this self-guided walking tour brochure of the art within the village. Creative placemaking through public art can stimulate economic development and encourage cultural tourism uh, in a number of ways. And this is a, a quote from some national folks who really dug into uh, this idea of what creative placemaking is. So creative placemaking Partners from public, private, nonprofit, and community sectors strategically shape the physical and social character of a neighborhood, town, city, or region around arts and cultural activities. It animates public and private spaces, rejuvenates structures and streetscapes, include, improves local business viability and public safety, and brings diverse people together to celebrate, inspire, and be inspired. In 2015, uh, building off of the, the, the success of the Danville project uh, and a growing awareness of creative placemaking, the Arts Council began a grant program called Animating Infrastructure, designed to foster partnerships between communities and artists. When you do creative placemaking through public art, it demonstrates that the place is valued by the people that live and work here and that the people that live and work here are valued. Public art adds value by enhancing civic pride. You can see there's several photos here of the, uh, the creation, the installation, and the celebration of uh, the Waterbury Project. Um, when people see themselves in their community reflected in their civic spaces, they're likely to have a sense of attachment that allows them to feel ownership, appreciation, and respect. It contributes to public health and belonging Creating interesting, beautiful places provides incentives for people to get out, get physical activity, and it often reduces stress because people feel safer in their environments. This is a sculptural rest stop um, on the Lake Champlain bikeway. This is another part of the 
one more aspect of the Danville uh, project. It supports social connections, encourages civic and community engagement, providing citizens with an opportunity to articulate what's important to them about their community. It activates the imagination through art and storytelling to emphasize our shared humanity, allowing the individual to better understand and connect with strangers and neighbors alike. So these are just a few of the benefits of integrating the public art into transportation and into <laughs> spaces. Since the program began, uh, and I should say, Michelle created this program and has led it since the beginning. Um, we funded public art, the Innovating Infrastructure Program has funded public art in 22 of Vermont communities. And I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle to dig into some of those. Sure, the, the program is still going on, but we thought we'd highlight just a few of the projects that are transportation related, just so you get a little flavor of what the possibilities are. So um, go ahead next, Amy. Um, as you can see from this mural project in Stowe, this is a mural on the bike path that was created by Juniper Creative. Next. In Montpelier here on Langdon Street, there was a temporary interactive light installation that changes colors or changed colors when pedestrians walked on the bridge across the, the bridge at night and which added an element of play and discovery to the streetscape. Next. The permanent kinetic sculpture on the Brattleboro Transportation Center is fabricated with durable aluminum bars and 4,000 shimmering stainless steel and aluminum discs. Next. The fish mural uh, the fish. in Bethel uh, was part of a broad community art project and installed on the retaining wall at the intersection of Route 12 and 107. I know, isn't that funny? That hook cracked me up. Um, <laughs> There was a hook, so just, to, yeah, there was a, at Halloween the, at the top of the retaining wall, they had some, um, they have little mannequins or scarecrows, I guess, that were aligning the top and someone had a fishing pole with a hook hanging down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, uh, a sculptural information kiosk and wayfinding sign was installed in the village of North Bennington. Next. A uh, community poetry project included inscribed poetry in the sidewalk in downtown Middlebury. Next. In St. Johnsbury, a lighted sculpture marks the entrance to the honking tunnel connecting the downtown with the river and the rail trail. It's a narrow tunnel that uh, I guess only one way traffic, so they honk before they go through. So the light of uh, the sculpture highlights that. And in uh, next, in Fairly, the community worked with an artist to design murals for the I-91. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped. Yes, I'm not. I, uh, yes, this is fairly. No, South Royalton. I'm sorry. Jumping my slide list here. Um, provides light and color in another underpass connecting the village and the businesses on the other side of the railroad tracks above. Next is Fairly. Um, this is one that's, uh, this is an image of a design. It has not been installed yet, um, but we're hoping it will be installed later this fall. Uh, and uh, since there were so many community int communities interested in doing public art projects, VTrans developed a guidance document to make sure that the projects that are located on state transportation facilities had the proper permissions. And um, I'm not gonna go into detail on that. Jackie can inform you on that information. Uh, next. And then another partnership is with the Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development. We work together with them on the creation of the Better Places program, which they will tell you about later. Um, this placemaking program resulted from years of working and planning by a large group of partners, all interested in supporting Vermont's economic and community revitalization efforts. This is a non-competitive program providing matching grants um, and empowering Vermonters to create inclusive and vibrant public spaces. Next. Um, and this is just uh, a sampling of all the partners that have been involved in the early pilots and um, working to get that uh, uh, program up and running. Next. And then uh, I just wanted to highlight this project uh, in Hyde Park because it was an example of a, pro a community that really kind of um, uh, strategically looked at different op funding opportunities and were able to build upon that. So they started off with a Better Connections grant, um, which is a partnership between uh, VTRANS and ACCD, Department of Environmental Conservation, the Department of Public Health, and um, kind of mapped out 
opportunities within their community. And this led the town to reach out to us for an animating infrastructure grant to actually design a landmark piece of art for that parking area that is the entrance to the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. And so they raised um, the, this uh, design required a little more money than they had in their pocket. So they reached out to the Better Places program and were successful in raising the funds to actually build this. And this should be installed later this spring, I believe. So um, again, this is a photo of the design. So as partners, we all really strive and work together to make communities better places to live and work and play. Next up. So thank you for inviting us to share a little bit about the exciting partnerships and art projects around Vermont. Um, we hope you are as excited as we are about the value that public art can add to our community and economic development efforts. Thanks. Thank you so much. I mean, this is so um, uh, so great because we talk a lot about infrastructure in this committee and transportation infrastructure specifically. And so for committee members to understand, like this is thing, these are things that we can carry back to our communities about opportunities if, if communities don't know about them. And I know you have some strong partners at the at, at VTrans or AOT, and we have Jacqueline here. Do you want to come up and and, uh, and share as well? I sure. wasn't sure how you guys wanted to organize your presentation. Yeah, yeah, come well, wonderful and. Thank you so much. I hope you, I know you probably are, can you stick around for- I'm off to Commerce Committee to okay. talk about another grant. A okay. Grant. Okay. Um, yes. Why don't you and Jackie okay. stay together up there and- um, uh, we'll Rotate. We'll rotate, yeah. I have a lot of junk here. Sorry, Jackie. Oh, no worries. I do have <laughs> some eight copies. I Great, and I think you posted, there are documents posted on our committee webpage okay. too. So um, yeah, we can, maybe if you want to hand those to one of our members and we'll let you get settled in. And Amy, thanks for joining us. Thank you for your coffee. Really appreciate this opportunity. And you'll be you guys in the card room? We're, oh, yes, we are in the card room. We'll be, there's a, uh, uh, Representative Jerome has a resolution at three o'clock on the House floor. We've got um, a devotional, the opera singer of uh, great renown, Josh Collier from Brandon, will do the devotional. And we're having an ice cream social to celebrate the creative economy at three o'clock in the cafeteria. Right. Levi, I almost forgot to tell you about. Right, and just <laughs> just because I'm always plugging Farmers Night, uh, Josh and his opera uh, members of his opera will be performing on Farmers Night at seven thirty. So, thank you, thank you, Amy. Great, welcome, Jackie. Thank you, and I do apologize. I was a few minutes late due to limited child care. Right? Oh, well, we just, no worry. <laughs> We're glad you're here. We're glad you made it. We're great. Thank you. Yeah, for being here today. So thank you for having me. I'm Jackie DeMent. I'm a planning coordinator with VTrans, and I am managing our new art installation program. Um, so I'm going to try to focus on pictures here. You heard a lot of um, what I'll cover too from um, from our Arts Council. So we have a new policy guidance that we developed because we are starting to see more and more requests for art in our infrastructure on our right of way on infrastructure and we wanted to be sure that we were taking into, into, into consideration safety concerns legal concerns there's just it's it's pretty complex when you're putting art in the right of way and on bridges and infrastructure so um, our guidance i do want to clarify it's for community driven community funded community installed maintained removed projects it's nothing that VTrans is managing at this point. Although at the, at the end, I'll get to this a little bit. There are some state DOTs that are expanding and doing some art themselves. Um, so I'll talk about that a little later, but this is just for community driven projects. <clears throat> so the first project that we had installed through our new guidance is right here in Montpelier at Gateway Park, which is off of Two. Um, so this is under I-89. Um, so this is just a mural project and these artists um, or this community plans to expand this project and install about a dozen murals over the next five years. So, um, and kind of hopes to make this park a little bit more of a landmark destination. It's, it's a place where people frequently access the river for fishing and other recreation. Um, this was our first project installed on the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. 
It's a pedestrian bridge in, in Morrisville. And this was created by students participating in a river arts mural camp. Um, this, um, you heard a little bit about this from Michelle and Amy. This is in Hyde Park. Um, this is expected to be installed in the spring. Um, and I do want to also just highlight that this project was um, funded through Vermont Arts Council and Better Places. So we are starting to see a lot of projects that are benefiting from funding programs like that. Um, and you heard a little bit about this Fairly project. Um, so this project has been approved, but is going to be installed after construction is completed. There's a maintenance rehabilitation project on this bridge. And one thing I want to mention about this project that was a little unique is they will be using parachute cloth that will be painted by community members off site. And then those pieces will be adhered to the bridge abutment um, to create sort of like a 3D element. And so that took a lot of back and forth with the, I hope my battery stays, a lot of back and forth with the community to sort of figure out something that they could engage the community members in the way that they wanted and create that sort of 3D element in a way that would work for the integrity of the infrastructure also. Um, a little bit about our application process. It's a three phase process where we try to do a little bit of initial vetting of the concept to make sure it's going to meet our criteria. And then the applicant submits a very detailed technical proposal, which is reviewed by subject matter experts at VTrans. And then if approved, gets reviewed by executive staff and actually Federal Highway does a fair market value waiver as well. And once that's all complete, there's an artwork agreement between VTrans and the municipality. This is just some details about the applicant responsibilities. Um, VTrans responsibilities, we're just really reviewing and the subject matter experts making sure everything is, is safe. Some details and requirements. Yeah. Does the application always come from a community rather than directly from an artist? Um, it can be a little bit of both, but eventually the art agreement is between VTrans and a municipality. So the application itself could be driven by a community member or an artist, but the municipality really has to be supportive and on board of the pro with the project. More details about all of the considerations that the applicants must be thinking about in their technical application. And then I wanna highlight some of the benefits. Um, I mean, to summarize, there's economic, social, and environmental benefits to these art projects. And this is a wonderful quote from Trisha Baller from the, who's the Morristown Community Development Coordinator who led the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail Hyde Park installation. Morristown. Sorry, yeah, Morristown. Um, and just to sort of summarize her thoughts, um, yeah, she just, um, if we think about places we have visited in our travels, one of the many things we remember is public art. And that is what this will, this will do for Morrisville. So um, I just wanna highlight that the community development piece that this is bringing to communities. And then briefly some opportunities to um, build on this start. Um, We've seen ways that VTrans is incorporating art into project design, such as this bridge that was completed several years ago in Brattleboro, um, which won many awards. Um, and I think that is something that VTrans could continue to expand upon. Um, and then other initiatives that other areas are starting to do here in Vermont and Burlington, the, through the Great Streets Initiative, there's a call to artists where they, um, as part of that Great Streets project, issued a, a like an RFP, a, a call to artists to be involved in that project development. And then another thing that I'm seeing is Minnesota DOT and Washington DOT have created an artist in residence program where they actually have an 
an artist on staff for a certain amount of time and then um, it sort of rotates through different artists that is involved in a lot of different areas of of program development transportation and that is that is all i have so welcome questions oh that's thank you so much for this it's really interesting to hear you know of course like with the kind of Reemergence of public art, just of course, where the rubber hits the road, to use maybe the greatest metaphor, but just how that ties in um, and the kinds of technical reviews and um, permits and requirements that are required is an important piece of the work. So it's really interesting to hear that. Yeah. So, um, Representative uh, Bartholomew? I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about unauthorized artistic expression. <laughs> um, we see it, it's also known as vandalism. <laughs> Yes. And I mean, you see it everywhere, but also I'm really discouraging to see some of these murals with graffiti yeah. on the mural. Any thoughts on? Yeah, well, we ask applicants to come up with a plan for how they would address things like graffiti or, or, or other vandalism. So that's part of their maintenance plan of how they'll address that. And they have um, volunteers that are regularly checking the artwork to, to check for things like that. Um, and in general, I think the artist community has found that um, in places like this mural park in Montpelier, which is on, pictured here in the screen, which is an area that, where there's been a lot of graffiti, um, by putting art in those places, it can help discourage graffiti. Not all of the time, but Michelle, maybe you know more. I would that. also add that the more community engagement that can happen as part of an art project will often uh, gather more kind of ownership and uh, interest and pride in a project. And so, uh, for example, in Philadelphia years ago, there was a huge graffiti problem in, in Philadelphia and they embraced it by inviting a mural artist to come and work with those graffiti artists. And they started intentionally working with them and creating murals together. And it's grown into this huge Philadelphia mural, mural program where there's hundreds of murals all over the city. If you go and Google it, you'll find it's, it's kind of transformed into this whole thing on its own. So I think there's opportunities to kind of work together to make those things um, even more positive for communities. So. Yeah. Well, that is kind of the intention of creative placemaking, that it's not just about the girl, but it's about the process. Yeah. So you, quoted in, in your presentation. I know, I'll just say in Brattleboro, we had a, a, there was a wall that was a problem with graffiti and the solution that was to put this beautiful mural with some Afghan um, artists from, um, uh, from Afghan uh, artists and our local artists. And it's like, it's really, it's quite stunning. And, and now we haven't seen any graffiti yet, but yeah, other questions? Yeah. Or is it Representative Shaw? So, uh, Jackie, whose shop do you live in at AOT? Planning. Planning, Michelle. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is this is great. I know we have some other. Uh, we might have some other questions, but thank you for bringing this. Um, uh, you know, the program. I think it was actually Michelle who kind of highlighted this report, where this, you know, that your collaboration partnership was highlighted. Um, so really exciting. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. thank you for the opportunity to share. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And so, can I just ask one question? Sure, there's a question here, yeah. yeah. Um, I think this is really inspiring. Um, I was wondering um, if this would be a way to work uh, to common purpose with the pilot project for projects in the pedestrian, um, trying out pedestrian and bicycling projects in the state right of way. If this could be something that, um, like, like demonstration projects. Yes. You mean? If, yeah. if there could be a way that a community could do two at the same time, um, and it 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 one of the challenges I, I worked with that program, as you may recall, last year, <laughs> and um, you know one of the challenges is um, in in places where there is no infrastructure right now is getting people to see the potential that is latent in their communities. And this seems like a great way to sort of um, try that out and maybe at the same time slow some of the traffic down because of the very engaging artwork and, you know, just accelerate our progress in um, 
places where it's been a little more of a struggle to make progress? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I actually manage the demonstration projects program also, and I see that they kind of go hand in hand. Well, yeah. one is a little more technical. Um, well, they're both technical in many ways, but um, I think there's some room for us to message that a little bit more. Um, so that's a great point that you've brought up. Thank you. Great. Great. Well, thank you. And feel free to stick around. We have the, um, and so we're in transition. So as I was, um, as sometimes many things happen in uh, conversations in the cafeteria, I was sitting with a few folks and I, um, talking about, one up, David. Yeah. Um, uh, and and uh, I was sitting with Amy Cunningham and, and David Sheets happened to come up. And he, uh, and, um, and he told me about another program that I was not aware of. So we thought this might be a nice opportunity. Um, I mean, most of us might know David as, as uh, our state curator who, you know, works within this building, but that work expands beyond the, uh, the Capitol complex. So it's a vast empire. Yeah. Yes, so, yes, yes. Um, yes, you're in the far reach of David. To the chagrin of PGF. <laughs> So, for whom I work. So welcome. David Sheets, PGS, and uh, thus I am the state curator, not state house curator, but a good 80 to 90 percent of our work is very much centered on this building and um, operating it as a museum uh, for the general public. But when my job was created, 30 eight years ago, and I'm the first and hopefully not the last uh, Vermont State Curator. Um, the It was a more all-encompassing job that they decided. There was lobbying to create a state house curator, and all of a sudden it, it was given to the Department of Buildings uh, to be more broadly um, involved with historic buildings in general that the state owns, but in addition, a state art collection that was in its infancy then, but thanks to the Art in State Buildings program, which Michelle has long uh, uh, worked for at the Arts Council, we have expanded public art in buildings, facilities throughout Vermont, in addition to the transportation related aspects. So now there's a huge art collection deployed in all of Vermont's state buildings, uh, triggered by the art and state buildings uh, million dollar trigger that makes a portion of the project available for the creation of public art, many cases, site-specific works of art. But I would say back in the 1960s, and I don't want to second guess uh, Amy by suggesting that the Arts Council became involved in the 90s with public art, because back in the 1960s, the Vermont Arts Council um, worked with artists all the time, acquired works of art that are still part of our collection. And one of the most significant uh, works are 16 monumental sculptures that are on the interstate highways. And they are known as Sculpture on the Highway, a name that they branded back in the, six, in the seven, early 70s when they finally placed 16 monumental works made either of marble from the Proctor quarries or concrete donated by the Griswold Concrete Company up in Burlington. So Vermont materials were used by internationally renowned sculptors who came from all over the world to participate in symposia here. Paul Aschenbach, who was a longtime sculptor and art historian and artist at UVM, was the visionary behind the two sculpture symposia that they had in 1968 for marble 
and in 1971 for concrete. And after the symposium, they had these monumental works that, quite frankly, couldn't go very far. <laughs> um, and they made the decision with the Federal Highway Administration as a partner to place them at rest areas and pull-offs all along Interstate 89 and 91 from the Canadian border to the Massachusetts border. And we have had them ever since. You may not be aware of them because many of them are overgrown. They were not put close to buildings intentionally, partly because they wanted in, if you can kind of put your 1970s hat on, <laughs> these, the sculptors wanted people to encounter the sculptures, not to see a label on it that had a title, the way a curator might do it. Uh, they wanted them to simply encounter them in the landscape. And um, children were encouraged to climb on them. Um, people, at, back then, if you look at the photographs, and I'll pass this around, it's a, a rare booklet from the sculpture symposium itself with Paul Aschenbach. The, um, the interstates were wide open at that time. So they had taken down many trees. Vistas were um, quite striking when you look at these old photographs of over 50 years ago. And you encounter the sculpture and see vistas that no longer exist because the woods have grown back up. So we, in our belief that the BGS State Curator's Office is responsible for all works of art that the state of Vermont owns, um, applied to the Save America's Treasures program, a federal grant program in Washington, D.C. And a year ago, we got a $250,000 grant from the federal government to begin to conserve these. So I will say that the little conversation about maintenance of public art is the thing that we forget about. When brand new art is installed, um, we tend not to worry about it. Um, but then after 50 to 60 years of monumental concrete and sculpt and marble out there, um, you do have to kind of attend to it if you want this to survive long term. And here's the great thing. We got the grant because we made the case that there is no sculpture garden in America that took its interstate highways as an opportunity to create possibly the the largest sculpture garden in the country. From Massachusetts to Canada, we have these 16 surviving sculptures by Austrians, Czechoslovakians, by Mexicans. Um, all of the sculptors came from foreign countries, um, England, uh, Paul Aschenbach was one of the few Americans and a Vermonter who also did sculpture on the highway. And so we're planning to interpret this. It is a Cold War phenomenon, by the way, because the symposia were born out of the idea of an Austrian sculptor named Karl Prontl, who was um, conscious that his country was right up against the so-called Iron Curtain. And so the first of these sculpture symposia were held in trouble spots in the world, places where tension existed and possible war might break out. And I am all too aware <laughs> that 50 to 60 years later, we seem to be in a climate that is not unlike the Cold War that we thought was behind us. 
And we seem to be entering into a globally tense atmosphere again. And our group, we have just formed a private 501c3 nonprofit called Friends of Sculpture on the Highway, because we have the mission to raise the match. So you get that federal grant, yay! But then <laughs> you also get the obligation to match the grant. And so private money will be raised to do the matching. Um, we've just begun that undertaking. If any of you are enthusiastic about this project, I would love to have more people in our little uh, group of friends of sculpture on the highway. But we're planning to go forth with other sculpture symposia. It has been suggested, for example, that if marble and concrete are represented, where the heck is granite? Where the heck are other materials that we think are Vermont materials that maybe will result in additional works of art of further down the highway? And for once we've ensured that these can be rescued from their moldering away and interpreted to the visiting public. The Randolph, I will say this, the Randolph Southbound Welcome Center is one that is due for, I think, a possible federal upgrade. Um, I know that the administration and uh, the legislature are both looking at that possibility. That's a surviving uh, rest area from the 1960s. And the front of it, we're working with historic preservation on this possibility. The front of that existing rest area, if they end up rebuilding, would be a wonderful thing to incorporate into the design if we have that opportunity. And we have to move six of these sculptures from abandoned rest areas, abandoned pull-offs, with the help of our partners, we hope, at AOT, because we're going to enter into an agreement with AOT, with the Arts Council, since they got us into this jam <laughs> uh, by coming up with the great idea of putting these sculptures on the interstates. And um, all three of us are gonna try to work together to ensure their preservation, but more importantly, to go forth and celebrate this unique collection of art that is all along our interstate corridors. So, any questions? That's great, that's great, David. This is yeah. great to hear about how, uh, the, you know, things, the art creeps into all sorts of spaces and in a wonderful and surprising way. So I think Representative Burke and Representative Dodge had yeah. their hands. Molly. Have you visited a lot of these? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we, we had to, uh, we actually applied to Save America's Treasures 10 years ago and failed to get the grant. Then Congress zeroed out the program. By the way, Save America's Treasures, which is one of the federal government's key preservation programs, was founded by a Vermonter, Ellen McCulloch Lovell, who was the longtime uh, director of the Vermont Arts Council and a wonderful uh, friend to all of us. Anyway, she, when she was on Hillary Clinton's staff, when she was first lady, uh, thought that this program would be the perfect way to celebrate the turn of the millennium at that time. And that's when they founded the program. But Congress has zeroed it out for many years. They did not eliminate it. So when it came roaring back, again, thanks to the lobbying of one Ellen McCulloch Lovell, um, it, uh, it meant that we could go again to the to the well and we managed to get the grant. So we're, we're thrilled uh, about that, but now we have a mission to fulfill. And how much, is there a timeline of how much time you have? Three years, we have three years to pretty much wrap the conservation, but we still have interpretation and other things to work on beyond that.
That's great. All right. I just want to know where the Mexican one is. <laughs> that is at Williston. So there are two. If you look at the Williston rest areas, which of course didn't exist in their current form back in the 1960s and 70s, but the Williston southbound has a Ramirez uh, sculpture that was incorporated into a plaza right outside the Welcome Center. It's in need of cleaning. It's in need of some work, not a lot of work, happily. Others need a lot of work, and that's part of, they look like, you know, if you go into the woods in some of these locations, they look basically like they were abandoned by some ancient civilization. <laughs> and <laughs> they no longer look like the modernist art that was originally there. So anyway, thank you. Well, this is great. This is it's great. great to have you as partners. I'll, uh, I'll try to sign you all up as friends of sculpture on the highway, right? I see lots of arts aficionados around the table here, not just transportation. And these guys have, <laughs> these guys have awakened me to the AOT of today, which is not the AOT of, you know, when I started. So it's wonderful that we have such great partners. Right. Well, yeah, it's great to see all the partners and all of the programs that you talked about this morning. Absolutely. So it's really yeah. it's great to see the collaboration going on. So thank you so much. For thank you. Thank, thank you for giving us this. Yeah. Um, and I think we're just, we're, our committee is scheduled for a little break.